The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving, 1820. Among the musical disciples who assembled one evening in each week to receive his instructions in psalmody was Katrina von Tassel, the daughter and only child of a substantial Dutch farmer. She was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen, plump as a partridge, ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches, and universally famed not merely for her beauty, but for her vast expectations. She was a wythal, a little of a coquette, as might be perceived even in her dress, which was a mixture of ancient and modern fashions, as most suited to set off her charms. She wore the ornaments of pure yellow gold, which her great-great-grandmother had brought over from Sardom, the tempting stomacher of the olden time, and the withal a provoking short petticoat, to display the prettiest foot and ankle the country round. Ichabod Crane had a soft and foolish heart towards the sex, and it is not to be wondered at that so tempting a morsel soon found favor in his eyes, more especially after he had visited her in her paternal mansion. Old Baltus van Tassel was a perfect picture of a thriving, contented, liberal-hearted farmer. He seldom, it is true, sent either his eyes or his thoughts beyond the boundaries of his own farm. But within those, everything was snug, happy, and well-conditioned. He was satisfied with his wealth, but not proud of it, and piqued himself upon the hearty abundance rather than the style in which he lived. His stronghold was situated on the banks of the Hudson, in one of those green, sheltered, fertile nooks in which the Dutch farmers are so fond of nestling. A great elm tree spread its broad branches over it, at the foot of which bubbled up a spring of the softest and sweetest water, in a little well form of a barrel, and then stole sparkling away through the grass to a neighboring brook that babbled along among the adlers and dwarf willows. Hard by the farmhouses was a vast barn that might have served for a church, every window and crevice of which seemed bursting forth with the treasures of the farm. The flail was busily resounding within it from morning to night, swallows and martins skimmed twittering about the eaves, and the rows of pigeons, some with one eye turned up as if watching the weather, some with their heads under their wings or buried in their bosoms, and others, swelling and cooing and bowing about their dames, were enjoying the sunshine on the roof. Sleek, unwieldy porkers were grunting in repose and abundance of their pens, from whence sallied forth, now and then, troops of suckling pigs as if to sniff the air. A stately squadron of snowy geese were riding in an adjoining pond, convoying whole fleets of ducks, regiments of turnkeys were gobbling through the farmyard, and guinea fowl fretting about it, like ill-tempered housewives with their peevish, discontented cry. Before the barn door strutted the gallant cock, that pattern of a husband, a warrior, and a fine gentleman, clapping his burnished wings and crowing in the pride and gladness of his heart sometimes tearing up the earth with his feet and then generously calling his ever-hungry family of wives and children to enjoy the rich morsel which he had discovered. The pedagogue's mouth watered as he looked upon the sumptuous promise of luxurious winter fare. In his devouring mind's eye, he pictured to himself every roasted pig running about with a pudding in his belly and an apple in his mouth. The pigeons were snugly put to bed in a comfortable pie and tucked in with a coverlet of crust. The geese were swimming in their own gravy and the ducks pairing cozily in dishes like snug married couples with a decent competency of onion sauce. In the porkers he saw carved out the future sleek side of bacon and juicy relishing ham, not a turkey, but he beheld a daintily trussed up with its gizzard under its wing and a peradventure, a necklace of savory sausages, and even bright Chanticleer himself lay sprawling on his back in a side dish with uplifted claws as if craving that quarter which his chivalrous spirit disdained to ask while living. 
As the enraptured Ichabod fancied all this, and as he rolled his great green eyes over the fat meadow lands, the rich fields of wheat, of rye, of buckwheat, and Indian corn, and the orchards burdened with ruddy fruit which surrounded the warm tenement of Van Tassel, his heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit these domains, and his imagination expanded with the idea how they might be readily turned into cash and the money invested in immense tracts of wild land and shingle palaces in the wilderness. Nay, his busy fancy already realized his hopes and presented to him the blooming Katrina, with a whole family of children mounted on top of a wagon loaded with household trumpery, with pots and kettles dangling beneath, and he beheld himself bestriding a pacing mare with a colt at her heels, setting out for Kentucky, Tennessee, or Lord knows where. When he entered the house, the conquest of his heart was complete. It was one of those spacious farmhouses with high ridge but lowly sloping roofs, built in the style handed down from the first Dutch settlers, the low, project, the low projecting eaves forming a piazza along the front capable of being closed up in bad weather. Under this were hung flails, harness, various utensils of husbandry, and nets for fishing in the neighboring river. Benches were built along the sides for summer use, and a great spinning wheel at one end and a churn at the other showed the various uses to which this important porch might be devoted. From this piazza, the wandering Ichabod entered the hall, which formed the center of the mansion and the place of usual residence. Here rose a resplendent pewter ranged on a long dresser, dazzled his eyes. In one corner stood a huge bag of wool, ready to be spun, and another, a quantity of Lindsay Woolsey just from the loom, ears of Indian corn and strings of dried apples and peaches, hung in gay festoons along the walls, mingled with the god of red peppers. And a door left ajar gave him a peep into the best parlor, where the claw-footed chairs and dark mahogany tables shone like mirrors, Andrians with their accompanying shovel and tongs, glistened from their covert of asparagus tops, mock oranges and conch shells decorated the mantelpiece, strings of various colored bird eggs were suspended above it, a great ostrich egg was hung from the center of the room, and a corner cupboard knowingly left open displayed immense treasures of old silver and well-mended china. From the moment Ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight, the peace of his mind was at an end, and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of Van Tassel. In this enterprise, however, he had more real difficulties than generally fell to the lot of a knight-errant of yore, who seldom had anything but giants, enchanters, fiery dragons, and much like easily conquered adversaries, to contend with and had to make his way merely through the gates of iron and brass and walls of adamant to the castle keep where the lady of his heart was confined. All which he achieved as easily as a man would carve his way to the center of a Christmas pie, and then the lady gave him her hand as a matter of course. Ichabod, on the contrary, had to win his way to the heart of a country coquette, beset with a labyrinth of whims and caprices which were forever presenting new difficulties and impediments. And he had to encounter a host of fearful adversaries of real flesh and blood, the numerous rustic admirers who beset every portal to her heart, keeping a watchful and angry eye upon each other, but ready to fly out in the common cause against a new competitor. Among these, the most formidable was a burly, roaring, roistering blade of the name Abraham, or according to the Dutch abbreviation, Brom van Brunt, a hero of the country round which rang with his feats of strength and hardihood. He was broad-shouldered and double-jointed with short curly black hair and a bluff but not unpleasant countenance, having, having a mingled air of fun and arrogance. From his Herculean frame and great powers of limb, he had received the nickname of Brom Bones, by which he was universally known. He was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship, being as dexterous on horseback as a tartar. He was foremost at all races and cockfights, and with the ascendancy which boldly strength always acquired in rustic life, was the umpire in all disputes, setting his hat on one side, 
and giving his decisions with an air and tone that admitted of no gainsay or appeal. He was always ready for either a fight or a frolic, but had more mischief than ill will in his composition. And with all his overbearing roughness, there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at bottom. He had three or four boon companions who regarded him as their model, and at the head of whom he scoured the country, attending every scene of feud or merriment for miles round. In cold weather he was distinguished by a fur cap, surmounted with a flaunting's fox-tail, and when the folks at country gathering decried this well-known crest at a distance, whisking about among a squad of hard riders, they always stood by for a squall. Sometimes his crew would be heard dashing along past the farmhouses at midnight, with whoop and hallo like a troop of Don Cossacks, and the old dames, startled out of their sleep, would listen for a moment till the hurry-scurry had clattered by, and then exclaim, Aye, there goes Bron Bones and his gang! The neighbors looked upon him with a mixture of awe, admiration, and goodwill, and when any madcap prank or rustic brawl occurred in the vicinity, always shook their heads and warranted Brom Bones was at the bottom of it. This rantable hero had, for some time, singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries, and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. Certain it is, his advances were signals for rival candidates to retire, who felt no inclination to cross a lion in his amours, insomuch that when his horse was seen tied to Van Tassel's paling on a Sunday night, a sure sign that his mister was courting or, as it termed, sparking within, all other suitors passed by in despair and carried the war into the and carried the war into other quarters. Such the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend, and considering all things a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature. He was in form and spirit like a supple jack, yielding but tough, though he bent, he never broke, and though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure, yet the moment it was away, jerk, he was erect and carried his head as high as ever. To have taken the field openly against his rival would have been madness, for he was not a man to be thwarted in his amours, any more than stormy lover Achilles. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character of singing master, he made frequent visits at the farmhouse. Not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents, which is so often a stumbling block in the path of lovers. Bald Van Tassel was an easy, indulgent soul. He loved his daughter better than even his pipe. And, like a reasonable man and an excellent father, he let her have her way in everything. His notable little wife, too, had enough to do to attend to her housekeeping and manage her poultry. For, as she sagely observed, ducks and geese are foolish things and must be looked after, but girls can take care of themselves. Thus, while the busy dame bustled about the house, or plied her spinning wheel at one end of the piazza, Honest Bolt would sit smoking his evening pipe at the other, watching the achievements of a little wooden warrior who, armed with a sword in each hand, was most valiantly fighting the wind on the pinnacle of the barn. In the meantime, Ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by side of the spring under the great elm, or sauntering along in the twilight that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. <laughs>